All right. Well, hello, and everyone, and welcome to our special live stream event on social media and mental wellness, focusing on tips for parents of tweens and teens, and brought to you by C.S. Mott Children's Hospital and the Michigan Medicine Department of Psychiatry. I'm Kara Gavin. I'm a member of the Michigan Medicine Department of Communication, and I'll be your host for this 75-minute discussion that will feature three of our top faculty experts. And we're so grateful to all of them for sharing their time and for to you for joining us, whether you're watching us live or via recording. And we decided to hold this event relatively recently, uh, right after Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States, issued a rare advisory on social media and young people to call attention to the impact that it can have on their mental health. And as that advisory said, uh, despite widespread uh, use among children and adolescents, we do not yet have enough evidence to determine if social media use is sufficiently safe for them, especially during adolescence, a particularly vulnerable period of brain development. Again, the words of our Surgeon General. And he actually cited data from a University of Michigan study called Monitoring the Future. And that survey recently showed that teens on average are on social media three and a half hours every day. So judging by the number of people who registered to watch this event live and the questions we received in advance, this is a topic that many parents are seeking more help with. And we've shared uh, those incoming questions with our experts and we'll ask them to answer some of them after they each give us a brief presentation based on their expertise and their research. If you're watching live, you can also submit a question for us to consider if there's time. And my colleagues will be putting useful links in the chat related to what our experts are talking about. And we'll also include those links in the email that you'll receive at the follow up uh, as a follow up at the address that you use to register if you did register in advance. If you're watching this as a recording, we're putting all of those links in the description of the video, and we really do encourage you to visit those uh, sites as you navigate this issue with your family. Um, so, and please, uh, once you receive the link to the recording, or if you have the link, please do share it with others. We know this is something a lot of parents are dealing with right now. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters briefly. Um, Dr. Joanna Quigley uh, is a clinical associate professor of psychiatry and pediatrics here at Michigan Medicine, and she's the associate medical director of all of our child and adolescent ambulatory psychiatry clinics throughout uh, CS Mott Children's Hospital. Dr. Emily Billick is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and she's a clinical psychologist who cares for patients through CS Mott Children's Hospital. And Dr. Jane Harness is an adjunct clinical assistant professor of psychiatry uh, and a psychiatrist who practices on our child and adolescent psychiatry consult service and in the psychiatric emergency department. So Dr. Quigley, I believe you're going to go first and you can share your slides and uh, let us know uh, after you're done, Dr. Billick, you're going to be ready to go after her. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so it's wonderful to be here with everyone today and to talk about, you know, as Kara was just saying, a very um, common topic in the media and the news right now, and one that I'm sure is um, a topic of concern and conversations you guys are having at home. So uh, over the time of this presentation, we just wanna try and highlight um, a few different areas that we think about when we wanna talk about social media and the considerations we might wanna take uh, with our own families and in our communities. So first, I just wanna review this time of development in adolescence and why we worry a little bit more about exposures our kids have and the factors that contribute to how they might manage them. Uh, a brief overview of recent trends in mental health and substance use. Um, and then diving into our topic of social media use, um, its implications, and then some very specific data and findings that we wanna share with you as well. And then we'll be happy to, to go over questions. So, you know, when we talk about this time in life, so the teenage brain, and when we talk about the teenage years, we're talking about a really wide age range, depending on the individual. So we think about age 10, 11, 12 as sort of those preteen years, but adolescence is actually creeping younger and then extending into our mid twenties, not just for sort of cultural and social reasons, but because of what we know about brain development. 
So we know brain development, you know, doesn't just stop when we turn 18 or 21, it's ongoing. There's what we call plasticity to the brain, but there are real changes that continue into our mid twenties. And when we talk about the changes that go on during this time, we're talking about in sort of more scientific terms, two really specific processes of myelination and synaptic pruning, which really are talking about making connections in the brain work better and work more efficiently and faster, um, and also sort of clean up those pathways so that they're working more effectively and those different regions of the brain are talking to each other in a more effective way. Um, we talk about very specifically the prefrontal cortex area of the brain when we talk about executive functioning. And what I mean by that is being able to slow down, think through things, make decisions, pause, process information and respond uh, rather than responding impulsively. And so that's a really important area of the brain to have working effectively when we're engaging with our world, right? And being able to function, being able to regulate our emotions and our behaviors. And the tricky thing in adolescence is that the area of the brain that's involved in reward or the limbic system is operating in a pretty robust way much earlier. So the sensation seeking, risk taking, and the reward system is really lighting up and happy to be working well, while our executive functioning, the prefrontal cortex is sort of chugging along, um, developing over that time period. And there can be a big disconnect and that disconnect might be bigger for one individual than another. So when we talk about the vulnerabilities that the Surgeon General references when it comes to exposure to social media, this is part of what he's getting at. Um, and in other words, talking about the fact that the brakes aren't always working even when the brain might be going at 100 miles an hour in terms of experiences and choices that an adolescent might be making. One area that we understand a little bit better than we understand social media uh, use and maybe behavioral uh, challenges with social media use is substance use disorders. And even though we need to understand them way better, we do know, for example, that the younger you start using a substance, the more likely it is that you will develop a substance use disorder. So that is a very complex set of factors. But one big factor in that is that the earlier you're exposed, during this process of brain development, when the brain is trying to figure out how to work and function effectively, does seem to derail parts of that process. And you may not be able to catch up, so to speak, in terms of being able to regulate um, that decision-making around that use as an adult. And another way we think about this and um, another way we understand it is there are a group of adolescents who may struggle more with impulse control um, during these years really have a high um, response to novelty seeking, to you know, pleasurable activities, and they may be at greater risk than of developing substance use disorders over time as well. So really trying to highlight that disconnect I was mentioning a minute ago. And you know, many of you listening, I'm sure are aware of the big concern nationally, internationally around the state of the mental health of youth today. And just to give context for the overarching concerns that we're dealing with when we're talking about adolescent health these days. This is um, data taken uh, over the last several years from a national study that tracks a number of different uh, behaviors and endorsed symptoms among our high schoolers. So I just wanted to, to show everybody here for this talk, you know, these really concerning trends around the endorsement of um, you know, symptoms of depression, um, at the consideration of attempting suicide, that, you know, 18% of high school students in 2021 had made a suicide plan at some point, and that 10% had attempted suicide. And for those of you looking at these slides, you can see this uptick in these trends over time. And that is a really big concern for all of us uh, involved in kids' lives today. I did wanna to highlight too, some of the gender differences that they're tracking because there are some gender differences that we also talk about when it comes to social media impact or consumption. And I, I also wanna say that, you know, this is a binary representation of reported gender and the data, but I do think that um, 
it still is telling us a story. So looking at this really big uptick, particularly for um, students identifying as female in terms of endorsing symptoms of depression over the last 10 years. Uh, and we see it for um, those identifying as male as well. And this is a snapshot around substance use. And this is data up to 2020. Um, again, looking at this adolescent time period. So this data includes um, eighth graders here in this blue color, and then we have 10th graders here in the red and purple is 12th graders for each of these graphs. So this is showing marijuana vaping, um, up to 22% of 12th graders having uh, vaped marijuana in the past year. In 2020, we saw a big increase in the number of 10th graders um, and 12th graders who were reporting use. And then um, past year marijuana use also being very significant at 35%. Um, I did wanna highlight alcohol use as well, because even though there's been a slow downtrend, that is plateauing over time. And one of the things we're really concerned about is the rates of binge drinking and particularly among girls. So we're seeing an increase ar um, around binge drinking, uh, particularly for that group and in correlation and combination, excuse me, with the other risk factors I've mentioned. Um, there are a lot of reasons to really pay attention. There are also, you know, as we start to talk about social media use now, there are also data looking at, you know, the impact of social media as it connects to other pieces around mental health, and that includes substance use. Um, you know, there's been some data about the amount of time you engage with social media and the greater risk of, of using substances. And I think all of this data is going to be really important to track over the next five and 10 years to understand better how to approach prevention with kids. And we're going to talk about different elements of that later in this talk. So as I was mentioned at the beginning, the Surgeon General issued a very significant um, publication and warning addressing this data and the concern around the impact of social media use. And that's what we're going to dive into now. Um, and just giving you a snapshot from a recent New York Times um, article, and this comes from the Pew Research Center, looking at um, how often teens are using each platform. And as many of you might know from your own households, very significant use of YouTube. Um, and I'm not sure what just happened to my, my screen, but um, uh, looking at TikTok, Snapchat and, Insta Snapchat, and Instagram as well. And now I'm going to hand it over to um, uh, Dr. Emily Billick to continue the talk. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Quigley. Yes, let me share my screen now. All right. Hope that's showing up on your end. That's good to be here tonight. So um, I really appreciate that intro and sort of context and framing from Dr. Quigley. And we'll be just diving a little bit more into the relationship between social media and mental health now. Um, just as Joanna nicely framed for us, it's no surprise to learn that teens are on screens and online a lot, right? In 2022, 95% of teens reported having a smartphone and nearly all teens report having a smartphone by age 13. Uh, this is probably not a surprise to the families out there who don't allow their 13 year old to have a smartphone and you're hearing from that child over and over again, but all my friends, everyone has it but me. That may be annoying to hear, but they aren't wrong. <laughs> Most teens have one by 13, whether that's the right thing or not, that's a decision for your family, but that is where the statistics are. Most teens, just like um, Dr. Quigley said, they report using YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat daily, and almost half of teens report being online or on the internet almost constantly. Maybe this sounds alarming, um, but when I reflect on my own use of the internet, I guess that's pretty true for me as well. Between work and um, my own social connections and play and doing chores, a lot happens online. And so again, I don't want to take a strong um, position that online is always bad or is always good. It's just, we have to be thoughtful about it. What, what if any impact does all this exposure have on mental health? So there is a fair amount of emerging research. You've probably seen lots of headlines. This past spring, tons have come out examining the relationship between mental health, social media, screen use, um, access to smartphones. 
Before we dive in, I just want to help frame this, keep a few things in mind. So research on groups will never per perfectly predict any person's relationship with anything. And in this case, your child's relationship with social media. Um, they are groups and they were most likely uh, studied on other people, not you. They can give us information that can be useful to consider when we're thinking about our own decisions. But we should also remember that most of the studies we'll be talking about tonight are not causal, meaning they cannot tell us whether using social media is what caused a change in mental health. This is also important to remember when you think about changes you may want to make for your family. Dr. Harness will talk about some options shortly for making some changes if you want. Um, but just remember that while changes to social media might impact your teen or tween's mental health, it also might not. There may be other factors that affect both of those things, right? Um, so you should make changes that are right for your family, that reflect your values and changes that you can feel good and happy about, regardless of whether it makes an impact on social media, on mental health in the short term or the long term. Okay, so that's plenty of caveats, I'm sure. Um, so there are several broad factors that have been shown to influence the link between social media and mental health. So one is age of access. A recent really large study was published that showed that youth who report getting access or owning a smartphone earlier have worse scores on a mental health questionnaire. So again, we'll take that with caveats, but it's a pretty striking graph that you see in front of you. Younger age of access to a smartphone or owning a smartphone is associated with at least one measure of lower mental health. Another factor that can influence this relationship is the amount of use. This is a slightly more complex relationship. For younger tweens, adolescents, maybe all the way up to 15, it's a pretty straightforward relationship. Less use, better mental health, more use, worse mental health in this measure. It gets a little bit more complicated 15, 16, where we start to see maybe a sweet spot emerge, where at no use, there are some negative impacts on mental health. And then from the, you know, more than nothing all the way to three to three and a half hour uh, mark, there's some benefit to mental health. And this is use per day, I should say. And then beyond that, four plus hours per day, again, starts to turn in the other direction, more negative impact on mental health in general, right? Keeping that in mind. Um, okay. So we can think about this. Maybe for older teens, there's a sweet spot. There are some benefits to mental health use more might be better. More is not better overall, but some is better than none. And then finally, in general, as um, you know, Joanna alluded to, the impacts of social media on mental health may be most prominent for girls. Um, and this is, like she said, there is this emerging trend, or it has been a trend for a long time, where um, mental health, especially anxiety and depression, tend to emerge more prominently for girls during the adolescent period. So we're not sure that we can attribute all of the discrepancy, say in this graph here, between females and males. That's probably not all attributable to mental health, um, but some of it certainly could be. So we wanna keep an eye on that. So that's some of the doom and gloom. There'll be more to come on that. In the meantime, I want us to take a step back there is a worrying relationship between social media and mental health, but we also know that there are some benefits from social media and these may not be trivial. So I want us to spend time to think about them. As long as the internet has been around, people have been using it to make connections. There's research that shows for some people, online friendships are as um, beneficial as uh, in-person relationships. So we can't just throw aside um, when your teen says, you know, this is my friend who I only know online. You shouldn't just throw that out. That means something. Um, they can be, these online friendships and connections can be especially protective and beneficial for youth that feel isolated, lonely, or unsupported in their local context, whether that's their school or their home environment or their community in general. So there's especially a lot of research emerging on the benefits of online relationships and community for the LGBTQ plus population. One thing, good or bad about the internet, is that it is vast and it can connect youth with people who may be similar to them, even if there's no one like that in their immediate proximity that can help them feel understood, supported, um, and feel like their identity matters. This is very protective. For some groups that have 
otherwise been shown to be at high risk. Um, so in addition to this connection and community fostering piece of the internet, the vastness of the internet provides opportunities for learning about and honing creative interests. Um, for those of you familiar with TikTok, you'll know that there's things like book talk and every possible uh, hobby or interest or um, you know craft that you wanna pursue or have a talent in, there is a community for you online. And um, ask your teen about it. They will probably be really, hopefully, uh, interested in sharing with you those unique parts of their experience and they can be pretty amazing. And then, you know, aside from this ability to foster creativity and personal pursuits, there's just general education. And when done right, it can be done really right online. So there are um, most social media platforms have educational content um, comes to fill in that space. YouTube is especially known, at least to me, uh, for their educational content. There's one channel um, shown here called uh, Crash Course, which maybe your kids have been shown videos from in their school because it is very well done, um, high quality, engaging educational content. This video on the scientific method was posted in this past week on their channel. And I will say that when I was preparing these slides, I got distracted for a little bit because I just wanted to watch the video. Um, I will also say that I'm clearly a big nerd. So that your mileage may vary with that. Um, the point is that through all of these venues, social media offers opportunities to explore, to develop identity in ways that are so healthy and critical for adolescent development. But there is the other side, right? And that's, that's the concerning side and you can't necessarily extract one without the other. So we're gonna talk about some of the risks that can arise from social media um, and especially from extensive use of social media or just online platforms. So right, one hand, internet provides access to so much free, high quality educational content. And then I'm sure you know what the other hand is. There's lots of harmful stuff out there. There's intentional misinformation. There's loud but mistaken voices. There's just a lot of inaccurate content online. You know, we were just talking before we came live about how you can't always trust pictures anymore because you cannot tell if they've been doctored. So we have to be discerning users and we have to teach our youth to be discerning users. And that can be hard, right? That's not always a way to know. So we have to be skeptical. Um, but worse, we also know that so social media amplifies the most negative, the most extreme voices, really pulling for people to feel like things are very, they're worse maybe than they are in reality or pulling for that polarization. There's other content that can be dan dangerous by glorifying suicidal thoughts and acts, self-harm, by normalizing risky behaviors like drugs and violence. There's um, pornography, which can be especially challenging to navigate as a parent of a younger child when there's really, it's very challenging to identify all the corners of the internet and, and protect kids from that. There's hard and um, dangerous stuff out there. One thing I also think a lot about in terms of a more insidious but challenging um, piece of content is beauty filters that are often on social media platforms like TikTok or um, actually, I don't know about the TikTok, but Snapchat um, certainly and uh, Instagram. And they really slowly erode self-image and can set unrealistic beauty expectations and um, sense of what humans just even look like. And to me, that's insidious and challenging. So that's the harmful content piece. And I probably only scratched the surface of it, right? I don't know what I don't know. I just admitted to not knowing enough about TikTok. So think about all the other things that our teens know about that we don't know about. Youth can also be unknowingly exposed to dangerous people. This is sort of the fear that we've all had going back as long as the internet has been around. Speaking of, in my family, we frequently quote the 1993 uh, New Yorker cartoon that says on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Um, and incidentally, I just feel like that was before its time, if in 1993, they were worrying about that. Um, but teens may share private information with strangers or people who they think are one thing and are something else, or people who they know in real life, but they shouldn't trust, right? Um, this can make them vulnerable to predatory or cyberbullying behaviors online, um, sharing private information or private photos that can all have, you know, negative consequences. So we want to be careful and thoughtful about talking to youth about these risks because they can have such a significant impact on the victims and in some cases lead to risk of self-harm or suicide. Um, 
So we'll talk more about things you can do in to protect kids later. But one thing I think is really important is to talk to youth about internet safety and tell them how to handle one of these issues if it arises. So again, in my family, one thing we say is there's nothing we can't come back from. Talk to me when you feel like a problem is unfixable. Because Dr. Quigley was talking about the adolescent brain. One other thing we know about the adolescent brain is that it is um, it sees things in all or nothing. And when it feels like there's nothing and there's no way of coming back, that's when things can um, they can feel a lot of despair and problem solving sort of goes out the window. So feeling like they can always come to a caregiver who they trust, who will ha have a calm head and help them think through the problem, be there for them. Um, that's a safeguard in um, scary or dangerous situations. All right. Um, also, we know that social media is addictive, right? It can It's designed to suck you in and keep you there. So this does it feels good in the short term and causes problems long term because it can lead to too much use, which interferes with sleep, with exercise and homework, family activities, you know, any other valuable activity that um, is being disrupted by by the the extent of social media or online use. So these risks can lead to a, not, a lot of negative consequences related to mental health. And we'll just talk about a few. Uh, I've already sort of alluded to a lot of them, but certainly, you know, the beauty filters, the unfair comparisons to people online, the, the amplification of a, a few certain kind of people looking a certain way that has been shown to have a negative impact on on self-esteem, on body image. Um, and we know that there's been a really dramatic increase in risk for um, eating disorders in the past few years as well. And I would not be surprised if um, these pieces of social media have played a role in that. We also know that there can be an increased dependence on external validation, needing likes, needing reshares, you know, needing follows, whatever the, um, uh, currency is in any given social media platform. So, that's not always super healthy and, and is, um, can be disruptive to mental health. Um, we also, of course, know that there are, that, that sleep disruption is a primary symptom in many mental um, health challenges, depression, anxiety, et cetera. So when sleep is disrupted from other causes that can have an impact on mental health. And of course, with physical activity or other um, disruptions due to overuse. And then finally, I just wanna say a word about the negative impact of the glorification of mental illness or self-harm or suicide that we find on social media. When I'm talking about this, I'm gonna talk about contagion, but I wanna be really specific about what I mean. So when we ask our children, important children in our lives about risk for suicide or self-harm, when we explicitly say, are you having thoughts about killing yourself? Are you having thoughts about harming yourself, hurting yourself, cutting yourself? Asking that question does not lead to contagion. Putting another way, asking your kid if they're having thoughts about suicide is very protective. It feels like it could put the thought in their head. And for a long time, people thought that, but research has been done and shows over and over again, it does not put the thought in kids' heads. And it lets kids know that there is a caring adult who they can go to, A, right then if they have those thoughts or in the future if those thoughts come up. What should you do? Parents don't wanna ask because they don't know what to do. And while this conversation warrants a, a, much, a much bigger discussion, I'll just say, you will not go wrong by validating how they're feeling, telling them that it sounds really hard, that you believe them, taking it seriously and helping problem solve ways to keep them safe. Um, you can always access 988, which is the National Suicide Hotline um, to get extra support if you're not really sure how to keep your kids safe. So that is um, a PSA just on the side of things, but I just wanted to be very clear. It's not what I'm talking about when I talk about contagion. Instead, we know that there's evidence that social media and news articles and videos tend to, at times, glorify mental illness. Um, and it can result in youth over-identifying with their mental illness or with these behaviors. It can seem like it's cool or sexy um, to be depressed or to cut yourself or you know, to think about suicide. Those are things that we care about, um, but I don't think that they make someone sexy. Anyway, the best thing I can recommend is to talk to your kids about it if you're concerned about this. Like I said, that has been shown to be protective. All right. 
So quickly, a takeaway. What can we take away from all this? Social media is not all good. It's not all bad. It may be associated with negative and positive outcomes, both for different individuals. Some may have been benefits, some may have um, consequences, but within the individual as well. So think about your own relationship with social media or any other activity, television, caffeine, alcohol, whatever. There may be times where or ways when that activity is helpful to you and other times where it takes away from your well-being um, or detracts. So it's not this case that this thing by itself is all good or all bad. We just have to think about it in a nuanced way and find ways to protect our kids um, as much as we can. I also want to just dial down the panic a little bit. The evidence on the risks of social media are not as co conclusive as um, headlines often make them seem. So research on long-term impacts will necessarily lag behind our experience. You can't conduct research into the future. You have to wait until that time passes. And headlines are attention grabbing by design, uh, even though the evidence is usually more nuanced. So all these considered caution and moderation are beneficial regardless. Uh, and now we're going to move into a discussion with Dr. Harness about how some what what strategies you might consider to help um, regulate social media within your own family. And I'll just end with my opening note, which is to think a little bit about what is right for your family. There's no perfect amount of social media time for all individuals. You think about your values, what's right for your family and for your child, um, and hopefully make some decisions that feel sustainable. Um, for your, uh, for your family. And with that, I will pass it along. Oh, Dr. Harness, you're muted, there you go. There we go, uh, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, all righty. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Billick, for, for that. Um, and I'm just going to kind of pick up right where you left off. Um, so what we know about social media use and youth mental health is that it is very nuanced and very individual focused. Um, in this 2021 umbrella review, uh, they were quoted as saying social network site use is weakly associated with higher levels of ill being, but also with higher levels of well being. A result that suggests ill being is not simply the flip side of well being and vice versa, and that both outcomes should be investigated in their own right. So we're not really thinking of uh, this spectrum as. Um, ill being being all the way over on the left and well being being all the way over on the right. We're thinking of them as two completely separate spectrums and that social media use may contribute to ill being by um, some of the examples that Dr. Billick gave, such as um, exposure to maybe um, challenging content, exposure to um, pro-eating disorder content, but may also be contributing to positively to well-being, for example, um, connection or education. So I'm going to go through and um, ask and, and talk about some uh, a study that we did um, through the University of Michigan using a platform called My Voice. My Voice is a text-based platform um, where youth aged 14 to 24 are um, texted questions to their phones and they are able to text back their answers. Um, so we were able to query over um, 800 youth and all across um, the United States. And we asked them the following three questions. Um, what advice would you give to young people who are new to social media? Have you ever felt like you need to change your social media use, such as what you view or the time spent and why? And have you ever deleted or thought about deleting your social media accounts and why? So we really wanted to get a perspective from youth themselves to understand how they are feeling about their own social media use and what advice they would give to their peers. So we took a look at, after, after doing some qualitative analysis, um, we took a look at all of the advice that youth gave to their peers, which coincided with the advice that professional organizations have for families. 
um, such as um, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So the advice that you've had that also coincided with the, the professional guidelines included avoiding interacting with people you don't know online, um, unfollowing or muting accounts that evoke negative emotions, using in-app reminders about how much time you've spent on a particular app in a day and set a limit for yourself, being nice online and not taking negative comments to heart, and being aware of the potential for developing a dependence on social media and not forgetting about real life. So I'm gonna go ahead and share some quotes from this study um, that were examples of each of these different categories. So for um, the category of avoiding interacting with people you don't know, um, a, a respondent uh, said, a couple years ago, I had been blackmailed by a person. I blocked and reported that person and deleted my account. Um, so this is a, a quote of someone who expressed a, a concern about that. Um, for the advice of unfollowing or muting accounts that evoke negative emotions, a youth uh, mentioned, uh, whenever someone is posting too many negative things, I just snooze them on my feed. I try to be mindful of who I follow and what I engage with because it can affect my mental health. So we're seeing that there really is a lot of insight that youth have about their social media use and what kinds of content they're viewing and how that might impact how they're feeling in that moment. Um, because I think we may have a little bit of time, I'll go through maybe a few other quotes here. Um, another person said, uh, listen, I know parental supervision does not sound cool, but I grew up with zero parental supervision on the internet at a young age, and it really messed me up. I saw a lot of things and experienced things that I wish I did not. So um, this, this particular participant, you know, really felt like there was content that they were exposed to on social media that negatively impacted um, their, you know, their mental health and, and, um, and kind of wished that they had a little bit more of a boundary when it came to social media. Um, for the next one, using the in-app reminders about how much time you've spent on a particular app in a day. Um, one participant uh, said that they recommend scheduling time to be on social media and sticking to it. I use a timer to help you stay on top of the time and don't waste your life away in social, live in the moment. Um, another person said, I have an iPhone and it shows me how much time I spend on social media. So there's kind of a, a self-monitoring and awareness there. And then also um, I was spending too much time on TikTok and it was messing with my head. So I told myself I will not go on past 9 p.m. So sending, setting some good boundaries and I, and I will definitely talk about the sleep piece, but I think that that one in particular is really helpful because um, we know how much sleep is important, especially for the adolescent uh, brain. Um, being nice online and not taking negative comments to heart. Um, some, so some advice here, honestly, it's not to take everything to heart. Tell an adult or anyone you trust if you encounter cyberbullying. Um, another respondent said, there's a lot of hate and bigotry online and I can only take so much. Another said, I've deleted my social media before it gets violent and cruel. So there's a lot of insight here about, you know, what kinds of content and what kinds of interpersonal interactions are having, people are having on social media and when it's maybe, and having that awareness of when it's maybe gotten to be too much. Um, being aware of the potential for developing a dependence um, and not forgetting about real life. I have a couple of uh, quotes to uh, share with you here. One uh, participant said, I've deleted my TikTok account. I literally could not stop watching videos. So definitely a, a great awareness there that they, they noticed that this app was really interfering with their day-to-day -day life. Um, another quote here is that people will spend more time on social media than they will with their friends. A lot of my friends will even spend time on social media while we are hanging out. And it's disappointing because it's like, here I am in front of you. Why are you on Instagram? So uh, a participant really sharing that they would like to get more out of their in-person interactions. And maybe some of these apps are keeping them from being able to interact to the extent they'd like in person. 
Um, and now uh, this is kind of a really uh, special part of the presentation where youth had advice to peers that pro professional organizations didn't even think to mention. So um, these are just four points here that, that they also um, commented on. So avoiding basing worth from likes or comments by turning off the like count or comments for your photos. Um, keeping in mind that not everything presented as fact is true, so do your own research. Keep in mind the widespread use of photo editing apps that people do not necessarily look like the pictures they post on social media. Um, and it is okay to take breaks from social media or delete the app or account altogether. So some uh, quotes about avoid avoiding basing worth from likes and comments. Um, one youth said, I started craving likes and follows, and after a while, I realized how unhealthy it was. So eventually, I ultimately decided to cut down my time and spend that time to help better myself, which worked after a few tries. So it's also important to know that, you know, even if a youth decides to um, cut down on their social media use or change something about their social media use, and maybe they their use kind of creeps back to how it was originally, they can always try again. Um, keeping in mind that not everything presented as fact is true. Um, so there were a couple of comments about this. Um, one participant said, I see so much toxic fake news being shared by family and friends. It is emotionally draining. Um, fact check, do not use social media without consciousness to process and research what you are reading and take nothing for truth. So two participants here who really had an idea about kind of um, learning more about how to do your own research and maybe learning about certain types of either search engines or websites that have uh, good credible information. Um, keeping in mind the widespread use of photo editing apps. So some advice here was um, that uh, I would tell young people that models only look good on Instagram because of angles in Photoshop. Understand that you're comparing your whole self to everyone else's best self. And I realized that I was only following celebrities and seeing their heavily edited photos and taking them in as reality. So I think this is a really important piece for any young person who is new to social media um, because they will be exposed to a lot of photos that are edited um, to the extreme. So it's important for them to have that understanding that they are edited and, um, and that their, real, their sense of reality isn't kind of warped. Um, it is okay to take breaks from social media or delete the app or account altogether. Um, their advice that they had about that was, I recently cut it out because it's very mentally draining and it makes you feel better spending less time on things that make you feel bad about the world and yourself. So there's a lot, there's a lot of um, public discourse that has happened about um, how people feel about themselves and that comparison factor of social media. But there's also a factor about how people feel about the world in general. And if they're you know, constantly being um, fed information that is really negative, it kind of takes a toll on your overall worldview. Okay, so now getting into some practical guidelines. Um, the first practical guideline that we have is about modeling healthy social media use, which can be a challenge in itself. Um, but youth really learn from their families about social media use. So modeling the healthy social media use uh, by keeping family time screen feet free, um, by um, learning about settings and tools together, and, um, and just this point that one-on-one -on -one time with your child is always helpful. Um, away from the phones, that can always be uh, a good time to start conversations and to um, develop um, and uh, foster those relationships. Um, the next practical guideline that we have is uh, open conversation. I think that this is so important that um, youth and, and teens feel like they can come to adults and talk about these things. Um, I think that for a lot of um, people that I've seen clinically, their concern is that if they open up to family members about their social media use, that it will be taken away altogether. And um, so kind of having a, an, open, an open mind and kind of a curious uh, disposition towards these conversations can be really helpful. Um, so these are some example questions. Um, of course, we wanna know what they like about social media. Um, so when we were thinking about those two spectrums of um, ill-being and well-being, kind of what are those contributions to well-being that they're noting? Um, maybe then also, what do they not like about social media? 
And then I also, in clinical practice, if I am asking, you know, a question that I really want to the, the youth to feel comfortable answering, I'll sometimes ask them about their friends first. So um, have your friends ever found themselves in a bad situation due to social media? Um, asking that question first before you ask them about themselves um, can kind of make it feel a little bit more comfortable um, to talk about um, and make them feel maybe a little bit more comfortable to then talk about their own um, experiences with social media. So then following up with, with that question would be, have you ever found yourself in a bad situation due to social media? Um, and then asking what does social media add or take away from your life? Um, are there things that maybe they used to do that they're not doing anymore because social media has taken up um, such a such a space in their life? Um, tell me about your online friends, right? We want to know about that. Um, we want to know, you know, what they talk about, what what makes them a good friend. Um, want to know kind of what that relationship looks like. Um, we also want to ask, do you have any fake accounts or do you have multiple accounts on one platform and, and what is that fake account doing for you? Are you, um, are you sharing something creative? Um, are you sharing your artwork or music or um, are you talking about something on this fake account that you feel like you can't talk about in real life or that you can't talk about on your real account? Um, have you ever thought about changing your social media use? Um, and as we see from the My Voice study, a lot of a lot of youth have taken steps towards changing their social media use. And then, um, what would have to happen for you to feel like you want to make a change to your social media use? So, you know, at what point, you know, would 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 you feel uncomfortable with how your social media use has progressed, whether that's time or whether that's content they're viewing or whether that's interactions that they're having. Um, and then what are some steps you could take towards changing either the time spent on social media or the content viewed on social media? Because like we saw in the My Voice study, um, they're already talking about the actual ways that they make those changes. And sometimes uh, the youth themselves already know kind of what, what is available as far as setting changes. But if, if they don't know, that's kind of where the next piece um, comes in. And then how can I help you with that goal? Um, just a couple of additional questions here. Um, just as I uh, mentioned earlier, sometimes it's easier to ask about friends before asking about the, the child themselves. So have your friends ever been cyberbullied on social media? Have you ever been cyberbullied on social media? Um, th these questions are really important because research tells us that youth are unlikely to tell someone if they're being cyberbullied. And if they do tell someone, it's likely to be a friend. Um, and cyberbullying, either as a target or a perpetrator, increases a child's risk for suicide attempt. So it is important to ask about this. Also, early ownership of a smartphone also increases a child's risk for being involved with cyberbullying, either as a target or as a perpetrator. And then also, we want to know about the kinds of content that they're seeing, for example, on, um, on TikTok, on their For You page, or on um, Instagram, on their Explore page. Are they seeing any kind of pro-suicide or pro-self-harm or pro-eating disorder content on social media? And then we want to follow up with, you know, how is that affecting you? Um, are you able to hide that content from, from your um, For You page or from your um, Explore page? Okay, um, this QR code that you see um, on the right side of your screen here is a link to a video that we made as a result of the My Voice study. Um, in this video, we discuss um, practical changes that can be made um, for the Instagram app. Um, so we talk about safety feature changes, turning off like and view counts, time reminders, and changing the content presented. And there's also um, written information about TikTok and YouTube settings. Um, this QR code will also um, send you to a link for the American Academy of Pediatrics Family Media Plan. Um, as you can see here, you can um, essentially type in a family member's name. You can make one for yourself. You can make one for um, any children in the home. Um, you can uh, kind of customize them. And um, as you see here, there are also like different age ages um, that, that um, you can click. Um, and I think that also highlights our point at just how individual this, um, this interaction is. 
For example, a, a 10 year old watching puppy videos on YouTube is probably a very different um, effect than a 17 year old who's um, watching TikTok videos about uh, eating disorder. Um, you know, these are very different kinds of effects. So it really is just very granular. And that's why we are recommending these really specific and individual focused interventions. Um, so it, I, if you go through the whole family media plan, there are lots of different um, recommendations that you can click that you would like your family to follow. I thought that these were especially important, so I decided to um, kind of list them here for you. Um, keeping the bedroom screen free at night. I think that that, like I said earlier, sleep is so important for adolescents and teens. And sometimes that having that phone in the room is, is just really um, tempting to, uh, to pick up for, for youth at night to see what their friends are doing, to check social media, to play a game. There are so many different things that could you know, be going on on their phone. So if at all possible, moving that phone from the bedroom to a different room, and maybe that means getting an alarm clock for them or something else, but it can be a really impactful intervention. Um, avoiding screens during the hour before sleep, that's also helpful. Um, not texting while driving, this is so important. Um, and I think that sometimes the emphasis is, is um, is on you know the other times uh, where when people are using social media, but um, youth do use social media while driving, and it is important to have a conversation about that, about just how dangerous that is. Um, keeping meals screen free that just you know can provide a lot of benefit for the family. Keeping um, keeping everyone open for conversation. Um, exploring privacy settings um, in our My Voice study, we actually found that the. Um, piece of advice that youth had most frequently recommended was about privacy and safety, um, emphasizing kindness, empathy, and respect always, um, and understanding how different types of content might impact emotions. Um, and then uh, lastly, there are a couple of really great um, guidelines put out by um, professional organizations. Um, this Children and Screens um, website, they have a number of really great webinars. If you wanted to learn more about like spe a specific topic, uh, such as social media and substance use or, um, or other uh, social media related topics, they have wonderful webinars that are available on their website. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry puts out facts for families and they have a number of really good ones about uh, social media use and other internet um, related uh, facts for families. And then the American Academy of Pediatrics, of course, puts out that family media plan um, and they have a number of really great resources as well. So these are the QR codes for these three websites. All right, so now um, I believe we are doing the Q&A section and I will hand it back to Kara. Thank you so much to you and all of our panelists for sharing such great information. I learned a lot. I'm going to be using this with my own family uh, and I hope everyone watching this live or recorded is also uh, going to be able to use what you all have shared. Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras, which they have, and their uh, microphones when they want to speak. And we're going to try and address some of the questions that have come in. And as a reminder for our live audience, you can enter a question in the Q&A area anonymously at any time. Only my colleagues will see it, and we'll try and get to as many as possible. We actually had literally over 100 questions come in ahead of this event, which was amazing. Um, a lot of them were around similar themes, so I've tried to coalesce them. So if you don't hear your exact question asked, know that we read them all and tried to pull some of them together. Um, and so a lot of them, a lot of them were about setting time limits and about uh, setting time limits for social media in general, in, in specific, uh, but also screen time in general. So video games, television, et cetera. And several people asked about using apps or the parental controls that might be built into certain smartphone systems um, that, you know, how can they use those or should they be using social media as a privilege that could be taken away as a consequence for uh, unwanted behavior? Um, Dr. Billick, I don't know if you want to start us off talking about this kind of limits. Dr. Harness, you already mentioned this idea of setting time limits within the apps themselves, but there are other limits that can be set by parents if you're the one who um, pays the, the cell phone bill for the teen. So Dr. Billick, do you want to start on that? And then maybe Dr. Harness can join in. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question and it's on, I think, a lot of parents' minds and um, there's a lot to discuss there and there's no one right answer, right? You have to, maybe I sound like a broken record, you have to do what's right for your family. I think there are some things to keep in mind when you are making the decision about um, making new changes, right? Enacting um, restrictions or um, settings that maybe haven't been used before and especially if they're going to be restrictions that are coming down from you that the child is teen is not in charge of. And I think the things to keep in mind, one are that what kind of reaction is it going to lead? Is it, what is the ultimate goal you're going for, right? And if it, I think it's really important to ask that question. Is it protecting them from harmful content? Is it trying to help bolster their, um, you know, social, the, their mental health? Is it about making them more connected to you and your family? Depending on what that main priority is, you may have a different strategy you take because it may, in the short term at least, really um, challenge your relationship with your child if you are going to put some really harsh um, uh, restrictions that feel like we're not um, come to together. And so I think the other thing I'll say about that is, at least for me, there is there are very few technologically based solutions that I can choose that my children will not outthink or, or outsmart. So be very thoughtful if your only strategy for managing your child's um, social media use is technologically driven because they grew up on this even more than we did. And so I guess this is all leading me to an answer where your best bet for success is gonna be around having the conversation that uh, Dr. Harness talked about before, really talking about building their own motivation what do they want to see different? Can you like have some patience a little bit if they're willing to make some changes and do it a little bit through their lens? That may not always be possible. Maybe they're already um, accessing some really unsafe content and then you may need to make a different choice. But just think about that. And then the one other thing I want to say about this in regards to motivation that comes to mind is no one likes to be manipulated. Teens especially hate feeling like someone is manipulating their behavior. So another strategy to talk about building that motivation to reduce um, social media use is letting them know the ways that the algorithm, algorithm time tends to try to control us and um, is designed to suck us in. It's a feature, not a bug, as they say. So um, sometimes that might be a more direct avenue into having them feel like that's a change that they want to make rather than something you do to them. Yeah, I would I would absolutely just echo what you said. Um, I think that um, a lot of different things might come into mind when when you're thinking about this, such as like the age of the child, what the concern is. Um, so, but but I think you know, in the majority of cases, you would want to have that conversation with the child and understand what they like about social media, what they don't like and, and find those things that they don't like and, and say, okay, well, how can we maybe change this? How can we, how can we um, go to your explore page and maybe um, hide or, or mute these things that keep popping up that are bothering you? Or how can we change the setting so that you get a reminder every 10 minutes um, to, to get off of the app? Uh, or how can we maybe block this person? So it really is very, um, dependent on the uh, what what the goal is, um, and then there are some features, you know, uh, of the of the apps. There are some setting features that can be changed. Um, and I'm not at all um, praising the apps. I think that there's definitely more that the apps can do to to try to. Um, um, optimize the well-being and minimize the ill-being, but um, but those are some things that that you know you'd want to partner with the um, youth with on about uh, how can we have a shared goal here, um, and then once you've identified what that shared goal is, um, then kind of figuring out what are the practical next steps for implementing that change. Thank you both so much. Um, we had a lot of questions from folks who maybe have a child who already has a mental or behavioral health diagnosis, something like depression or anxiety or ADHD, autism and eating disorder or something else. And um, are there special things that you all advise uh, these parents and these teens uh, around their social media use given their diagnoses? Are, are they more vulnerable to some of the harmful effects? And Dr. Quigley, would you like to take that on? 
Absolutely, yeah, I can start and um, others I'm sure may wanna chime in. So I think building on what's been said by both uh, Emily and Jane, you can start with sort of humble inquiry or curiosity with your kid around this um, because a lot of them will have more self-awareness than you might realize, you know, going back to Jane's data. So I think either reflecting statements such as, you know, I noticed that when you're feeling down, you tend to go off to your room and I think you're on your phone more or asking the questions, like I said before, how have you been feeling? What are you noticing about how you're spending your time? Um, how are your friends doing? And they may be able to um, identify ways in which their coping may not be that helpful for how they're feeling. Um, as Emily said, though, if they are really struggling and they are retreating and withdrawing and their decision making is not great, which can be definitely be part of depression and anxiety, then um, stepping in and really using the observation statements, but also saying then because of this, I think that we need to remove phones at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., or whatever it is that you feel like might be an effective intervention, um, I think can be very appropriate. And as that person feels more well, having more time back and then having that conversation, as Emily was saying, when you reintroduce more access about how are we gonna be monitoring this and what, will you notice about yourself that might be a red flag that we need to pull back again? Um, so, you know, we all are really concerned about the interfaces that encourage um, really destructive behaviors like has been referenced already tonight around say eating disordered behaviors or self-harm and substance use. Um, so if there's a direct link that's really harmful, I think that sometimes we have to pull back more significantly for a period of time to allow recovery to happen and then a, rec a more recovered and healthy brain be in a place to better manage things, so. Great insights, thank you so much. Um, I, we also had several questions about situations where your child is not going to be with you. Maybe they go to a friend's house and they want to spend time on social media or video gaming uh, there. Maybe they're live streaming a video game and chatting with people. So that's a, a form of social media we haven't really addressed, but it's still that idea of online social connection right through a virtual presence. Um, so this gets into that broader issue, though, of how families can differ on what they allow and how they handle screen time. And maybe there's special circumstances when a friend's over. Um, so how can parents navigate what this, whether they're the, the parent who's trying to limit things and they have uh, their child has friends that are more permissive uh, or vice versa? And how can they talk with those parents or um, how they can equip their child to talk with the other children? Yeah, I'm happy to to start on this one, I think, of course, all the same factors come into mind for me. How old is the child? Of what type of content are you expecting them to be viewing at a friend's house? Um, and so within some of those um, guidelines I, or, you know, like benchmarks, I might say like for teens and older or yeah, and older tweens, you know, just having a really thoughtful question for yourself about what your priorities are before you start this conversation, right? You may have different parenting values than other parents on so many different things, right? Maybe they allow more sweets in their family or you do and things like that. And think about whether this is something that differs dramatically from that. Is this something that you feel it's really critical to talk to other parents about? For example, um, my kids are a little bit younger, but before my children go over to someone's house for the first time, I always ask that parent if they have a firearm in the home. That is a non-negotiable to me. That's not like a parenting difference. I need to know that my kid is not going to have access to a firearm. That may be how you feel about social media, in which case that's going to be a hard conversation you have to have with your kid. Um, and it may be a hard conversation that you have to have with that parent. It may also be the case where you say, this is not something we do in our family. And it may be something you do at other friends' houses, um, as long as it doesn't start to, I don't start to see these kind of impacts, I'm okay with that difference because different families will choose different things. Um, so that, I guess, is my gut reaction to that question, but I'm sure other people have uh, other really helpful comments about that. Yeah, I think that, you know, it can feel uncomfortable or awkward. Um, and one approach for some families that I've heard is sort of similar to Emily's and they'll make a general statement, you know, I'm so excited that our, our kids are hanging out. These are safety questions that I ask everybody, please don't feel like I'm judging you. Is there a gun in your home? Do you have a trampoline? Um, you know, are you going to be home the whole time? 
what's your approach to advices in the house? And so it sort of gets wrapped up into general um, safety and comfort level for you. Um, other approach may depend on each kid and you may have a kid who you know is going to be pretty good at self-regulating or you have, may have a kid who you know is gonna be pretty easily drawn in. Um, and you know, just saying to your kids, look, I know at so-and-so's house, you guys tend to spend more time gaming or I know they have their own computer already. Um, you know, this is what's important to me. And um, let me know if you think I need to check in with that parent um, or asking questions after the play date, which is something that I think can be really helpful. Like, can you tell me like what you were um, watching? Was anybody around? Does your friend have limits on their devices? And oftentimes kids will be pretty happy to let you know because they notice and they talk about these things. Um, if you have a kid who's struggling more and you're worried that they're gonna access content that may be triggering for them or uh, make them feel worse, I think that's a really very appropriate time to say to that parent, look, my kid's been dealing with X, Y, and Z lately. It would, it's really important to me that they just aren't on X device or playing Y game um, while they're hanging out. And if that's an issue, I'm happy to pick them up early if you think that's what's gonna be going on later at night, things like that. That was great, thank you so much. Um, we also had questions from families who have decided not to allow their children to use social media at all or not to use certain platforms that their friends or their older siblings might be allowed to use. And how can these folks um, help their children feel or deal with these left out feelings they might be feeling? Um, and are there and is there anything a parent can do to uh, make sure that a child doesn't create an account on a platform that they have said no, they don't want their child using? Um, so anyone want to take that? I think Dr. Billick, maybe. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's first of all, I think it's just so hard, right? My my heart goes out to all those families, but especially those kids. Like it is not a good feeling to feel left out. And adolescence is a vulnerable time where social connection and being similar to your peers is so important. And I think that's my main recommendation is to validate how they're feeling, but not necessarily change your behavior. If this is a really important um, limit for your family, uh, whether it's having access to social media, access to a smartphone, and you know you're the only one then that's, that's holding out, then my heart goes out to you too, because that's a lonely position to be in, to have to say no to your kid all the time. Um, I think telling your kid that's really hard. They may not want to hear it anymore, but really trying to um, empathize with that feeling. Um, one thing we've started to hear because there's been enough time that social media smartphones have been around is some kids who have graduated high school, um, who didn't get smartphones until they graduated high school or until they started high school or much later than their peers. And everyone that I've heard about has said, I hated it at the time and I'm so grateful that my parents did it. So that may be cold comfort to your child, but it might be comfort to you. If you can hang on, just like Dr. Quigley said, the later you introduce these things, the better off. Um, and if you have to walk back certain privileges that you offered before, that's so hard. If you can do it slowly, if you can do it in a way that um, is sustainable, it's hard. Kids will, will feel really upset and they can cope with that, right? And um, they can cope with feeling left out. It's an important emotion to learn how to cope with potentially early, but that doesn't make it easy. Dr. Harness, anything else you wanted to add on this? Sure, yeah. Um, I would just add that um, if the main reason for wanting that social media account is to be connected with peers, maybe finding that some in-person ways that they could feel connected, whether that's like an after-school sport or whether that's a club, you know, finding other things so that they can still have, you know, get that from, um, from their lives. Um, and then I would just say too that, you know, for anyone, um, for any child at any developmental stage, um, that going from no social media to having social media is a big step. So having some kind of, um, having all of these conversations about it, it through that process, depending, you know, and kind of tailoring it to that age of whatever, whatever that age is for that person when they are first having their first social media account is really important so that they can um, understand about 
um, the, the risks, benefits, et cetera. And also talking to schools about um, having uh, programs that might you know, also provide some education about things like um, misinformation on the internet. I think that that's something that, you know, in addition to having mental health curriculum in schools, I think there should also be some um, media curriculum in schools because it is so, uh, so important um, nowadays. Thank you so much. Um, I also thought of one thing that I think when one of you was mentioning uh, the the guidelines about I think Dr. Harris, you were saying uh, you know not having social media on uh, and and other things while driving. And as people are you know learning to drive and 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, making sure they understand that that critical role that we know of correlation with accidents and distracted driving. And actually, Michigan now has a new law taking effect June thirtieth that will really um, bar a lot of interactions with your phone if you are the driver. And I think we have a link to that we can put in chat. So another aspect of this is if your teen is learning to drive, making sure they understand that they will now be able to be pulled over and ticketed and fined if they're seen using their phone while driving. Um, so I think we've come to the end of the time. Is there anything else that any of you want to add that we haven't addressed yet? It's been such a great session. Um, and thank you for this great discussion. Thank you for our audience who sent in great questions beforehand and live. Sorry we couldn't get to every question uh, individually, but if you did register in advance, you will uh, receive an email with links to the information that was in this um, session and uh, a link to a recording so you can share it with others. If you're watching this as a recording, you can find uh, links to more information in the video description itself and on the Department of Psychiatry website. Um, if you'd like to find out how to donate to support innovative research and care, like what you heard about tonight, um, we have information on the Department of Psychiatry website and click giving. Um, and then also we want to make sure that we don't end without mentioning a really important resource for people in any sort of mental health or substance use crisis. Uh, and this could be somebody, you know, yourself, someone you know, your child, uh, you can call or text the number 988 from any cell phone, or you can visit 988lifeline.org and use the chat function on the website. This is a free 24-7 service that can help with an immediate crisis or critical situation, and it can connect you to people uh, near you that can be that can offer further resources. So again, if you're worried about someone immediately or you're uh, feeling not safe yourself, 988 is an incredibly important number to know. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. Please uh, be safe. Please, you know, use this information with your, your family. Thank you to the Department of Psychiatry and C.S. Mott Children's Hospital for making this event possible and have a good night.